right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Rising Through the Bullshit. Today we have a special guest, Aaron Huey. Is that how you say it? Did I butcher it? I I got it. All right. Amazing. So I don't formally introduce other people because I feel like we individually introduce ourselves the best. So I'll let you introduce yourself for the listeners. Well, hello. Uh, My name is Aaron Huey. And uh, wow, I this this goes back uh, a minute or two. Uh, So I'll give I'll give the uh, the quick rundown. Yeah, I was abandoned by my biological father. I was bullied mercilessly as a kid. Uh, I was sexually assaulted by my best friend who had the exact same name as my biological father. I turned to drugs and alcohol to compensate for everything that I had felt I was missing or lost. Uh, Of course, that failed miserably. And through this all, I found a deep sense of my own spirituality, began running in sobriety, began running teen rites of passage programs and events in a martial arts school. And it snowballed into a residential treatment center for adolescents and um, a crazy audacious life uh, where I got to find me inside of the great sphere of being, doing, feeling um and thinking and Mm -hmm. have have uh really ended up on the other side of this just eyes wide open being uh you know when 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 the waves are coming and you try to stand against the waves and they're just too powerful they just keep knocking you down and so one wave comes and grabs you and then you just relax and you end up on your feet on shore that's Mm -hmm. what life has been like um except right now in this very moment i feel like i'm being tumbled across coral reef but it's 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 good it's i still know where this is going i'm tumbling towards the shore yes exactly that's such a important point when life starts to get hectic is that oftentimes our resistance to how things are is the biggest struggle. We end up trying to tread water when in reality we could just turn around and surrender to where it's taking us. Isn't that the Zen? Like, like I see, I feel like surfers really get the Zen of learning how to ride the nature of things towards the result versus this is not going to deposit me on the end result in my time, in my way, based on my plan. And so therefore I must struggle. And then we get mad because we're struggling. And I really believe, especially right now with a big struggle in my life is that I'm struggling because I'm struggling and it's hard to let go. I am, I am too programmed, conditioned, habituated to fighting for what I want. And so now just assuming that my wanting is the will trying to manifest and I can just boost the manifestation and that's going to be enough without the struggle. Yeah. It's hard to trust. It sounds a lot like you're kind of stepping out of like a masculine run paradigm into a feminine paradigm. (laughs) Well, when you, (laughs) when you absolutely. And I think I think a big part of it is like, I I was initiated into witchcraft at 12 years old. Were you? Yeah, and I was. And part of that growth through drug addiction and coming out on the other sti- side and still being able to, to embrace the goddess and the concept of the feminine divinity and be a, a 32nd degree Freemason, which is also, is it's very extreme masculine spirituality. It's the square and the circle and knowing which to embrace or which to look at in any given moment that the the ones there is no hierarchy Mm -hmm. they're just different shapes of the same spiritual result and it's again the struggle is do i do i make it happen or do i let it happen and what if neither of them works and that's the Mm -hmm. that's the fear that's the struggle is that i'm afraid yeah it all comes back down to feeling unsafe or unsure and trusting ourselves and what we feel called to do in that moment. And you talk about when do I know to go and when do I know to stop? And I always say, if you just try, you'll find out really quickly whether well. you were supposed to stop or go. Like if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Then, you know, you can adjust I from feel, there. 
And, and it does, it feels like there's so much at stake. So see, here's what's happened is that for the past 16 years, I, I founded and I run one of the most successful adolescent treatment programs, residential in the United States. Yeah, let's talk about that. It, 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 we've won Fire Mountain, we've won awards. It's been you know, top 50 healthcare provider in the United States, top 100 innovator of healthcare in the United States. It's been incredible. And last month, the insurance companies raised my property insurance from $20,000 a year to $370,000 a year. How is that even legal? Because it's insurance, because it's yeah, America, because who am I going to complain to? Politicians? Like, yeah. guess who's paying the politicians? Mm -hmm. So, like, it, it felt like for 16 years, we've been winning battle after battle, helping children and families and teens, adults win these battles only to lose the war. And feeling this, this sense of purpose denial. Mm -hmm. Right where where the hardest part about change, the hardest part about my sobriety 23 years ago was the idea that that meant I had to give up my identity. That for for those the 14 years I was the, the I was the guy who used, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden I had to be something other than that because before being the guy who used, I was the guy who was abused and the guy who was assaulted and the guy who was abandoned. And then I became the guy who was an addict. And then after that, it's, you just became the guy. You just mm. became Aaron and embracing that. And like, like we had said before, what came from embracing like the thing I used to hate, which was myself, into something I, cause you can't hate yourself into something you love. Right. No. So you, you start loving yourself into something you love and the doors just flew open, flew open. And now all of a sudden I find myself back in that. How can I hate something so much that I think it's going to have any positive effect? Like what insurance companies have done to my business, what I've watched them do to families for 16 years, refusing to pay for their children's health care, mental health care, suicidality, drug addiction, self, self harm, tech addiction. And then at the end of it to be, I had to lose. Like it feels like I, that I look in the mirror and I'm like, okay, I'm, 52 years old now what next mm -hmm. and i and this is this is not midlife crisis i had that in 2018 <laughs> so i've been through that one because i know what i'm doing next but i don't know who i am who does that next thing mm -hmm. um so how do you how do you trust not knowing mm -hmm. that's that's the piece that i could never picture myself being 50 years old and not using drugs and now i'm 50 years old and I can't picture myself not helping and mm -hmm. it's helping other people stop helping other people quit helping other people find their divinity within themselves. So now what, how do I, how do I help parents? And I think I've got the plan and the idea and I'm staring at these giant poster board size papers of business planning and everything, but inside, I just want to strike something that struck me mm -hmm. and it's not real. It's not there. It's too big. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that's, that's been life in the last month. And then I got bit by a dog and put in the hospital. Oh my goodness. But it's been a month. <laughs> One thing after the other. <laughs> yeah. But here it is. Here I am. Exactly. Showing up amidst it all. And I guess a big piece is also like you said with identity is having a practice that allows you to remember that you're not what you can do, that you're yeah. so much more than that and peeling that back <laughs> isn't that isn't that and i think i wrote this to you when when we were talking over there on pod matches this this concept like my the way of my life the path the the trail it's been the you know the pain was my path the the wound was was my way the tears were my trail my wreckage became my resume of who i am and now i don't need any of the wreckage or the pain or the tears or the wound i can just be on the path like but who am i on this path without the pain because the pain has been my identity that abandonment that mm -hmm. assault that addiction mm -hmm. that abuse that was who i was mm -hmm. and now can I be without that? Mm -hmm. Who's Aaron without being 
the recovered victim, the, the addict in recovery, the, yeah. Who's mm-hmm. that guy? I guess it's kind of hard to like find a definition of yourself. If you're already trying to get away from like identifying yourself with the ego, because ego is like, Hey, what am I classify me? But the reality is that you're not classifiable to begin with. Isn't that one of the dangerous things about the conversation around ego as well as, as, as coaches, as seminar instructors, as facilitators of personal growth and development, we like to point at the ego and say, that's the bad thing, Mm -hmm. but, but ego keeps us safe, right? Ego Mm -hmm. is the thing that says, Hey, don't drive 90 miles an hour down an icy curvy mountain road because you'll die, right? Ego is trying to preserve you. But then the preservation, the perseverance of ego starts to plan is like, don't ask that beautiful person out because they might reject you. And that feels like death and death by lonely means you should get on the internet because that's communication. And so the, that that ego voice becomes louder than than the actual life and limb and mm-hmm. gets into the psyche and the subconscious of hold still or something's going to hurt. I don't know what, but something is. Mm-hmm. And without identity, which I agree, without identity, you feel lost in the construct. Mm-hmm. But, but if you're not identified within the construct, the construct could reject you and none of us can survive the saber tooth donkey alone in the cave. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Absolutely. So what I want to ask a little bit more about your healing journey. What do you think specifically helped you heal from drug addiction and your trauma? I got, I got the, the gift of the, the divine, direct experience. May 21st, 1998 on a country road. Um, I got that moment where the night before I had hit my knees and said, you got to stop me Mm because I cannot stop myself. And I was praying to any God or goddess that would listen. I, because I was so desperate, I was 28 years old, living in my parents' basement or in the back of my truck. I was only seeing my daughter on, on weekends. I, I had no custodial rights. My ex was just being really, really chill about my struggle, but keeping our daughter and herself safe from me. And I just hit my knees and I grabbed Marianne, Marianna Williamson's book, Illuminata. And there's a prayer for the addict in there. And I, I hit my knees in front of my altar and I just gave it my all. Cause I had, I had tried everything but recovery mm. and I just gave it my all. And the next day I got a miracle and found myself uh, within a 24 hour period, experiencing unconditional love from three masculine sources. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, what I can, what I can define as a Christ consciousness, just an experience with an entity that radiated nothing but love and forgiveness. Mm-hmm. So I could, in my, in my simple human brain, I can only identify that as the Christ consciousness and being a devout pagan heathen, my whole experience of, of, of faith and spirituality and religion, having an experience with the Christ consciousness was explosive Mm -hmm. to say the least when i came home i contacted um the triangle club the the 12 step meeting club there in longmont colorado and someone answered the phone on the first ring and said triangle club what can i do for you and i said when's your next meeting i think i'm an addict and they said where are you i'll come get you and i said don't don't do this don't don't do it And he goes, it's okay. And I said, don't fucking say it. Don't say it. And he goes, it's okay. I love you. Uh And I just, I I said, you can't do that. I can't do this. And I hung up Mm. next day. You know, I just cried all night because I had, I had had my moment where I got rid of my drugs and I got rid of my pipe and I got rid and I, and I called, I'd had that Christ consciousness moment of just love, just the radiance of forgiveness for everything I had done for all my trespass. And then this stranger who just said, I love you. Like, it doesn't mm-hmm. matter what happened before right now. I love you. Cause you're calling. And the next morning uh, I came downstairs 
And I was going to a, a meeting at work is what I told my parents. I came downstairs and my parents were sitting on the couch. It was like noon or one. And they were watching Clean and Sober with Michael Keaton in that movie. And, and I sat down and I'm watching part of it. I'm like, I cannot believe this. Of course, I believe this. Of course, this is happening. Grab the remote and turn off the TV. And I said, um, I'm not going to a meeting at work. I'm going to a 12-step meeting. I think I'm an addict. And my mom just went pale. And my dad, who is not my biological father, he's the man who raised me. He looked at me and he said, whatever you need me to do, I'll do it because I love you. Mm -hmm. And it was in that moment, in 24 hours, having three experiences of, of the masculine, the masculine divinity, a masculine stranger, and the masculine father figure, my dad. Give me the thing that I had been longing for my whole life and had mm. only found in drugs. And it had been, I was surrounded by it constantly, you know, in a divine source and a stranger in a, in family love was there. And I never saw what was right in front of me. I was always searching outside for it. And when my dad said that it, it broke me. And I realized that my path of recovery was about unconditional love and bringing that moment of love to others. Then the, the last part that, that was part of the divine experience was after my first meet, well, I went to my first meeting and they said, tonight's a speaker's meeting. So obviously I <laughs> thought that meant that I was talking. I love and that. so they said, our speaker for today is, and I stood up and this biker grabbed me by the back of the shirt and yanked me down into my chair. And I turned to swing on him. And he said, sit the f down and shut the f up for once in your life. And maybe you'll learn something Oh my God. like he didn't <laughs> flinch. And so I sat down and the actual speaker for the meeting got up and started talking. And he said, I started smoking pot at 12 years old. I was sexually assaulted and abandoned by my father and bullied in school. And he proceeded to tell my story. Crazy. And I realized I was not terminally unique right. on the way home. I got pulled over by the cops and the cop came up and said, your tail lights out. Have you been drinking or using drugs? And I said, for the first time in mm. seven years, no, I just went to my first NA meeting and he shined his flashlight around the car. And there was my stack of books that I had just spent all my money on buying every book NA had to offer. And he looked at me and he says, what drugs did you use? And I said, cannabis and LSD. When was the last time you used LSD? He said, about a month and a half ago. And he goes, keep going back. It works if, if you work it and you're worth it, uh -huh. which is what we say at the end of meetings, right? And I knew that he was in AA somewhere, mm -hmm. that, that I had just met another 12-stepper. And that to me, I didn't need any more evidence or proof. And that's that was the beginning of my life. That was 23 years ago. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. I love the beautiful synchronicities that happen. I really think that that's when we can allow divine intervention. So whatever you want to call, like in my opinion or my perspective, there's just one source mm. and then there can be like almost like a tree diagram where it comes down. There can be like branches sure. from it, but there's like one original source. I don't know if that's God. I don't know what to call it. I don't think sure. our human understanding can even conceptualize the accuracy of what it is because we're so limited in our thinking as is, but I love the synchronicities. And I think that when you get to that point where you are on your knees and you have finally give up and you're so heart open when you're asking for help, that that energy is like reverberated through the universe and that, that genuineness and that surrender to, I need your fucking help is yeah. really what calls it in. So you should be proud of yourself. That's awesome. Thank you. I'm, I'm proud of you. Thank you. So Dad, I guess, I, I, I'm in agreement with you about the single source. The archetypes of divinity has been my study. You know, pantheons, monotheism, pantheism, all of it. But these, these are symbolic of a singular creative source that, and I, 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 I believe in all humility, which I have very, very little to spare, we we can't comprehend it. No, and I, and I like I said, I'm I'm a 32nd degree Freemason. The level of work to understand the architecture of the universe has resulted in truly 
truly brilliant Freemasons and philosophers going, we don't know what the hell we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. That's like the one certain thing is change is constant. And I really don't know. The more, you know, the more you realize I have no fucking idea what's going on and that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Right. So I'm, I'm guessing that your journey itself is definitely what brought you to become a parent interventionist. What was your parents, um, support like they had from your story i'm guessing that they really had no idea that you were using that's right yeah how was that for you like <sighs> honesty as a child had always been a big problem for me but honesty uh made me want to kill myself mm -hmm. right? you know, honesty meant i was abandoned and adopted and assaulted and abused and an addict that was that was honesty that was reality and, and I had to do people as a, as a young father, people who did know would tell me, you got to slow down. You got to stop. You got a kid, you got to have a job. And what they didn't understand was when I was high, I was happy. And when I was sober, I was suicidal. Yeah. So you could have the wisest person in the room tell me I needed to sober up, but that just meant I was dead within a week and not from withdrawal symptoms, but because I was so depressed of the, of the truth. Um, so that was hard to explain. You never really have the words for it. What my parents provided for me, which ultimately in the 20 years that I have been coaching parents whose kids are struggling. All right. And that's, that's the Facebook page I have is parents of teens that struggle parenting teens that struggle beyond risk and back. My podcast is a show for parents whose teenagers are struggling because the same message I have had all the way through leads ultimately to one result. You have to provide the safest possible place for your kid to completely destroy and demolish their lives. You, you cannot change an addict. You cannot change someone who's struggling with mental health, but you can provide for them in an environment, a truly powerful environment for them to change themselves, for them to alter their behavior and their choices and their decision-making process. Or you can fuel and fulfill their notion of rejection, shame, and guilt. Yes. And that's what my parents gave for me. I am eternally grateful. Their, their conservative liberalism, whatever version of, of political understanding my parents have, it always turned into a liberal love with conservative uh, uh, value and support of family is this important and, and this, but a willingness to meet me where I was, regardless of wherever that was. I was failing school. They loved me. I was doing well in a sport. They loved me. And that love didn't change based on performance mm -hmm. and being a father uh, and a bonus dad of a 25 and 26 year old. That's what I've given my kids is a safe place to screw it all up. <laughs> I fucking love that. <laughs> <laughs> Cause that's at the end. What, what, what else do we have? Exactly. And I think that that's a huge thing is people. Um, I'm not a parent, but <laughs> I'm assuming because I myself actually was kicked out of my house from parents for drug use and other things. But anyways, but that's the biggest thing is people will see what this child is doing and not to be like oh stop doing that that's bad but never ask like why why are they doing this you know like so especially for families where things are just pushed under the rug and like things are fine it's dangerous to not have your reality validated as a child and to not have your wounds felt you know there are this is you've just touched on the, the 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 first thing we teach when i get into a coaching or i'm running a parenting event or in the in the app of parenting classes that i have with the the the, the whole first thing is here's why you mm -hmm. first of all there's no such thing as a bad choice right there are risky choices and there are good choices but there are not bad choices unless you want me to look at you as a parent and say those are bad parenting choices make good ones and it's judgmental bullshit what's real is that everything we do will facilitate one or more of five basic human needs safety power connection freedom and worth those without those are developmental needs and without any one of those the structure can begin to collapse 
right now, the entire world has lost its feeling of safety. Whether you believe it or not, you're being told on a daily basis, the people you love, if they breathe on you or if they hug you, it could kill you, right? So nobody feels safe. And look at what's happening when everybody loses their sense of safety. So once one of those five pillar collapses, everything goes. But if you look at why your teenager is cutting, you look at why they're running away, it's going to facilitate one of those five needs, mm -hmm. safety, power, connection, freedom, or worth. When I got high, I was happy. Why was I happy? Because I wasn't suicidal. That's safety. I had a bunch of friends who came up to my off grid property because I was living off grid before it was cool in the early 90s. I had a bunch of friends coming up to my 70 acres and we were hanging out every weekend and partying. I was connected mm -hmm. because I didn't have the, the government breathing down and the man and I was I was powerful. And look, just smoking weed fulfilled three massive human needs for me. Smoking cigarettes, self-harm, suicide, any, everything we do is an expression of need. Everything mm -hmm. we do is an expression of need. So to say it's a bad choice when I have found a shortcut to get my needs facilitated, that's wrong. It's not a bad choice. It's a risky one. Cost mm -hmm. me more than I benefited from it. Ultimately, that's the risk is that this will cost you more but you can't look at someone else's strategy and say, that's bad. You can say exactly what you said, which is the most important thing any parent can say to a kid who's struggling. This makes sense while you're doing this. Mm -hmm. Like the validation, what you said, that is the single most important conversation you can have with your struggling teenager is yeah. a conversation where you validate these ridiculous, risky, asinine, costly choices that they are making. Mm -hmm. And even like as an adult, when you still, for example, like a lot of people don't go through the healing process. So they walk around with their trauma and just keep, it keeps getting triggered and they keep perpetuating these cycles, feeling those needs that you talked about. And even now when I feel myself being triggered by something that is irrational in the present moment, Right. type sense but makes sense because it's playing an old pattern in my mind the biggest thing to help me is reparenting myself in that moment and talking to that aspect of myself that's coming up and being like I see you and I see the dots to why this makes sense for you and then just bringing myself back into the present being like it is safe for like speaking to this aspect of myself saying like it is safe for you to exist exactly how you're existing in my body like I got you I'm not going to abandon you I see you I feel you like you can play inside of me and it's safe I feel like that's a huge thing I, I, if we what you're able to do for yourself requires prefrontal cortex activity mm -hmm. right which we cannot access in survival mode so when you're freaking out, when you're feeling anxious, depressed, and you pull yourself out of that, that is something that you are capable of doing, which a child cannot, because mm -hmm. they're, they don't have a fully developed prefrontal cortex. So yeah. do we expect teenagers? Do we expect children to validate themselves and make sense of this? You know what? That's a huge point, actually. I feel like that's definitely validating as an adult, looking back and realizing the trauma that you had and realizing, oh, I don't have to blame myself because I couldn't understand to the degree to which I can understand today. A, a man, a woman's brain does not fully develop prefrontal cortex, full capabilities until around 25 to 27. I still um, got a few years. <laughs> a man's ability ever. I don't ever know. Stop. I, right. Shut up. <laughs> no, it's, it's about 28 for men, 28 wow. to 30. So there, there is a developmental process. So what if so much that we're consequencing and punishing is actually not about willingness? It's about capability. Oof. How, how yeah. bad would you feel if you were given consequences to someone who wasn't living up to their potential, but they're actually not capable of doing that and you're punishing them? Like that's, that's, that's how you create trauma, number one. But yeah. With you, when you validate, hey, look, this is challenging for you. This, I see your struggle, and it makes sense that you're making these decisions because you're getting a reward for smoking weed, running away, self harming. 
you have to validate. Well, if I validate it, they'll keep doing it. If you validate it, you become an ally to them. And you cannot change the system from the outside. I don't care how many people are marching in the street. If you want to change the system, you become part of the system and steer it from the inside. Yes. You cannot change the course of a river by lifting it up on your back and walking 10 feet. You have to throw rocks into it. You've got to get in and change the water flow until it erodes the shore. And it's the erosion from within that changes the course of the river, not mm -hmm. from standing outside the river going, you need to flow a different way. You're making two Turn around. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I love that. Yeah. Okay. I feel like you also touched on a great point where you're talking about capability over willingness. So I guess yeah. one of the biggest things we're trying to get out of the, I guess this is also more applicable to people who are more developed in their prefrontal cortex. So a little bit older, like young adults, probably in, in their early twenties where I guess step one is like validating for yourself, but step two would be getting your nervous system out of that fight or flight mode. <laughs> what? I know you're, you're a hundred percent right. You're suddenly, so, so, so you're saying you're not fully developed yet because you're still, you know, but you're, you understand your emotional intelligence is way overly developed for Mine? you to say something like that. Yes. Oh yeah. No, I know it, my experience has blessed me <laughs> with that. Thank you, trauma. <laughs> you're, <laughs> That's, that's what I mean by the wound becomes the way that the pain becomes the path. Like, like ultimately this wreckage is our resume. And I digress that now I'm 52 going, it doesn't have to be anymore. You've got another resume. You can start flashing in front of your employer. Right. But that is so much easier said than done. It's oh. insane how much validation we get from over attaching ourselves to the trauma. Of course, like, especially when it pays out. Yeah mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, financially. If it's mm -hmm. paying out, you're going to hold on to that because it's a gain. It's a win. And damn it, go for the win. I mean, if you're not playing to win, what are you playing for? But this, this concept of willingness versus capability beginning with you know how, how you validate yourself, how you look at yourself, how you begin to self-care like that's where this all starts. If you getting your nervous system back online happens one of five ways, in my opinion, sleep, drinking water, eating healthy food, moving your body and breathing on purpose. Like, like you, you've got to get back to foundational basics. You can, you can talk a lot of nonsense about seminars, which I love, by the way, being a coach, which I love, by the way, hiring a therapist, which I love, by the way, but you could have the greatest spiritual, emotional coach on the planet. Tony Robbins could be your personal development coach. But if you're not breathing on purpose, if you're not drinking enough water or eating well, if you're not exercising and you got crap sleep, it won't matter what he says. Mm -hmm. Like you have to go back to the basics of humanity to get your nervous system calmed. I had a I had an experience recently in the in the treatment center where uh, a young girl had locked herself in the bathroom. She had broken a plate and took a shard into the bathroom. And we got into the bathroom. There were two therapists there and myself. And she's shaking. She's crying. She's holding this thing against her wrist. And I said, I need you to give this to me because if you don't, I'm going to have to call the police and they're going to take it from you. And I'd rather you just give it to me. Now, the voice that I just use is what we call the regulated nervous system voice. And she refused and is screaming and crying. And, you know, I'm not and they can't and they won't. And she's offline. I might as well see the spinning rainbow ball of doom and keep hitting enter. It doesn't matter if I'm talking about how she needs to give it to me or talking about boiled broccoli. What matters is the context, right? Because I'm talking in a really calm voice and I'm just saying, hey, listen, darling, I need you to hand that to me now. And I'm not going to give you another warning because I need to call the police unless you hand that to me. Because that the bottom line is the strongest nervous system wins. Mm -hmm. And until I walked in the room, she had the strongest nervous system. I didn't say best. I didn't say healthiest. I said strongest. Her screaming, crying, holding a shard of glass against her wrist was the strongest nervous system. And I could see my therapists offline. They were scared. And if they're scared, they're in reaction to the situation. And I had to go in and be the strongest nervous system. 
Mm -hmm. So my third statement was to her, okay, I'm going to take that from you now. I'm going to be grabbing your wrist with my right hand and taking it out of your hand with my left. I'm going to do that now. And then I did it. And she's screaming and crying. But in the struggle, she let the glass go. And because I was in my prefrontal cortex, because I had the strongest nervous system room, I could tell she let go on purpose, which told me I didn't she doesn't need actually to want to do that. To herself. And I didn't have to do anything beyond that. I said, thank you. And I left the room and left her with a therapist. Then my nervous system became unregulated. Right. You're like, and I, and I started happened? shaking and yeah. I'm saying, and I had been doing that work for 20 years, the interventions at that level. When you run a treatment center, that happens, that stuff happens. So now I'm in my office, I'm shaking, I'm crying. I can barely swallow because I got a lump in my throat. I feel like I'm going to poop my pants. I call her executive director and I can't finish a sentence. And she's like, Aaron, go for a walk, hang up the phone and go outside and walk in the trees. I'm like, okay, I'm, um, I just got a, it was really upsetting. She's like, go outside. <laughs> go ground yourself. <laughs> yeah. And I went outside and I'm walking and the breathing starts and then the brain comes back online and it, it took about two hours and I'm practiced at this. I'm skilled at this. It's going to happen. And mm -hmm. when it's your own kid who tries to kill themselves or ODs and you're now at the hospital and you know, you're not going to work for the next two days and you don't know how you're going to pay the mortgage. And this little teenager could make better decisions and they're not, it's hard to be online. Yeah, definitely. There's so many layers to it. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, I love that you talked about the forest and grounding and kind of that even comes back to the nervous system reset. That's what it is, right? It's like the root chakra. If we want to talk about the chakra system, um, but you can't integrate that material if you don't have a solid foundation first. Right. So a lot of people will find information online and then they'll just become overloaded with information where it's like, take one piece at a time, integrate that, feel into it, make aligned actions into your life and see how that changes. And then you will know when you're ready for something else. That's the other biggest thing that I find when people are trying to move forward and heal and progress. They've, they have this idealized timeline and they might just rush themselves on it. Like I should be further. I should be healed. I should be over this. When in reality, like you are your compass, your connection to source from within you is your compass. And you realistically don't need to be watching anybody else, anybody else's journey and just respecting your own and knowing that when you're in a space of indecision or unknown, that you shouldn't be taking action from that place anyways. That is a sign that you are way too overloaded and you need to come back down and integrate the material that you have and just be more present and wait for it to come to you. Again, back to the beginning, cycling back to the feminine paradigm coming forward now right. of trust, surrendering, surrendering into yourself and trusting that when you are meant to know something, when you're meant to be clear on something, you will become clear on it. And that that information might synchronistically appear in your life through other people talking to you or just a quick Google search or a picture on a car, just being open to receiving information in new ways that's not so rushed and not so chaotic and not so fight or flight mode so that we can actually have more capabilities. The ability to go back to that one thing. Right. I say there's five foundations of self-care, which gets your nervous system back online, get your prefrontal cortex working again, instead of your limbic brain, fight, flight, freeze, faint, fornicate, feed. Those are the six survival Fs mm -hmm. that your limbic brain is capable of. Everything else is prefrontal cortex. But it may be you only get to do one. It may be that you only have three minutes before you have to walk into the school and do whatever, or the phone rings and you know, it's that person you need to confront and your heart rate goes up. And so you get one thing and you pause and you take a drink of water or you pause and you take a deep breath and you're really aware of how fast your heart rate. And suddenly it's that self-awareness. It's that taking a moment to get a drink of water to that's it. 
that that's the beginning of your foundation's work. It's not becoming a monk and sitting in a cave and staring at a wall for 10 years until you achieve enlightenment. That's an idealized concept. Again, it's an archetypal image of something that we reinforce by continuing to have that image. Being grounded, being centered is means I need to go outside and you go outside and you just stand there and you breathe and you're there. I don't know, 30 seconds, 30 minutes doesn't matter. What matters is that you took the moment and you acted on the moment of self-reflection of self-need of self-care of self-understanding awareness, openness. Mm -hmm. And it's that change that starts the domino effect of throwing a pebble in a river that ultimately that pebble will tumble into a rock that tumbles into a boulder that tumbles into the shore that changes the flow of water that erodes the shore differently that changes the course of the river over time. But it begins with <sighs> on purpose, because mm -hmm. you breathe accidentally all day long, you eat accidentally, and we sleep accidentally, and we drink accidentally, and we move accidentally, but doing it on purpose, that's the key. Yeah, that's what prayer affirmations, manifestations, magic, burning a green candle instead of a red one. It's just that you're doing something on purpose that's focusing your intention where that want is the will trying to manifest and you are now creating your day instead of your day creating you. Yes. And then you habituate that. Yes. Yeah. And a huge part for me has been meditation. Like if I meditate every single morning and without doing meditation, I don't have enough space. I don't have enough time in my mind between the triggered responses and my uh, reactions. So meditation has been key for me. And so has yoga for retraining my brain to realize that like, I don't have to listen to it. I can actually see what it wants to do and redirect myself and pause. Yeah. And, and everybody, meditation is another one of those archetypal words that everybody has this view of what it should. And you use it. It looks like before. so many different things. Oh my God. And so it could be things. anything that you do on purpose for yourself intentionally. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it, it, watching TV doesn't count. No, for <laughs> me specifically. Actually... <laughs> yeah. No, for me specifically, I have to have my eyes closed, but I know that some people can go for a walk and just be very aware of their surroundings or they could be washing the dishes, you know, but for me, I have Cleaning. to have my eyes closed. I am such an intellectual person that I am so fucking distracted. Like <laughs> I need to close my eyes. You know, my brain's like, please shut me off for like two seconds. Like for me, I need that to, to relax. And but, it's, um, it's, it's cleaning for me. Yeah. The moment, the moment life, I, I told you about my last month, my house, my office, my podcast studio has never been this clean because it's like every I'll finish this and I'm going to go out and do the dishes here in my office. Cause cleaning is where I say, I like what you said, the space between things. That's, mm -hmm. that's it. It's the space. It's the gym. It's a walk. It's the dog. It's picking up the dog poop. It's taking a single breath. It's connection before correction, alliance before compliance, and then being really intentional of what you're connecting and align, uh, aligning yourself with mm -hmm. God, goddess, you, the, the, a tree, the dishes, doesn't matter. What matters is intentionality. Yes, exactly. And that's why like that meditation portion is so important for me because I can't become clear on what it is that I really want to be intentional about when there's too many thoughts that aren't mine in my brain, like from social media, from the society, from childhood, from what am I doing today? What am I doing tomorrow? All of that. And meditation allows me to just breathe and be like, wait, what does my soul want me to do? you know, creates that space for that to be heard from within. Um, so I, I want you to just talk a little bit about what mistake or sorry, how people often mistake spiritual growth as emotional growth. So I see that a lot in recovery because uh, spiritual experiences, direct uh, experiences, direct connection, intimate communion takes place in recovery. And it can come through laughter. It can come through you know, growing closer to divinity. Um, but there are five energies that we have to consider. And spirituality is one of them. And I can't, I see these five energies as a pentacle. Mm -hmm. 
because it, it, it has to balance out. And some are very earthly and material and some are very divine and ethereal, but they are still equal in distance from center, center being you. In the hieroglyphic monad, that was where the center of the circle began in the design. It's the circumpunct, the original, uh, the alchemical symbol for gold or the sun is a circle, but there's a point in the center and that's you, Mm -hmm. right? What encircles you are the energies and the five points are mental, physical, emotional, spiritual, and financial because, and financial is very, very real yeah. in this world. Now, a dollar bill is 30% nylon and 70% cotton. So the financial piece is very largely what you make it. Yeah, it's an energy itself. Yeah, it's exactly right. Yeah. You know, a, a, a rich asshole is still an asshole. Right. Uh, a, a rich philanthropist is still a philanthropist and it is rich is a secondary experience of it. You still have assholes and philanthropists all over the place. Mm-hmm. So when I, I've watched kids with every spiritual path and no spiritual path. And, and in our, in our program, we absolutely do not teach spirituality in my humble, which is not a word I embrace often opinion. Uh, spirituality, especially for children, is something that that's that's family work until the child's ready to do their own work. And I see too many people embracing a spiritual path of a mentor, because it's a rebellion against what their parents brought them up with. I a lot of pagans, a lot of Wiccans, a lot of heathens are that because they're still in rebellion against their Christian or Jewish upbringing. Mm-hmm. And that you can, again, you can't hate something into something you love. I was raised an atheist, but by very open parents who said, ah, you, you, you do you boo. And so at, at 12 and beyond, I, I did. And that allowed me to embrace any aspect mm-hmm. of divinity, not just one that my parents liked or one that they didn't like because that got under their skin. But the moment somebody has the, spiritual experiencing and the woke begins the awakening begins of holy crap i'm destined for something bigger than i can conceive i'm connected to something greater than i can believe and i have the ability to achieve my desires right conceive believe achieve receive and then experiencing the reception of unconditional love unconditional forgiveness All of a sudden, they stop doing their emotional intelligence work, where they were just like, I don't have to feel what I feel, because I feel good attaching to divinity. I don't have to deal with the fact that I was abused, abandoned, assaulted, addicted, because I'm now at one with the universe or with nature or with, and you have to do both. Mm -hmm. Because I would assume if we're going to give the God goddess form a, a face that whatever that face you give it would like you to be emotionally intelligent when you meet, right? Not just really aware that you are a spiritual being having a human's experience, but part of that human experience is navigating your bullshit. Being human. And yes. What if, and I love this what if question, what if our journey on this realm is to have emotional experiences because that grows the divine? Every time we have an emotional struggle and reconcile it or don't, and we take a leap of faith and we sprout wings or go splat, yeah. that divinity grows, that the, yeah. that the universe expands its consciousness based on every emotional experience we have, then who are we to ignore the emotional experience, to deny it or to substitute anything for its work? Mm-hmm. Because I, I believe my closeness with divinity comes from my closeness with who I am, right? If I am a creation of the creator, then I could only understand that thing, which I seek to know through understanding myself, all of myself, every aspect. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Cause the funny thing to me about becoming like having your awakening and realizing those things, the thing is like you were always connected to source. <laughs> so you've always been here. You've all it's always been here. They've always been here whatever you believe in. 
but now you just have an awareness of that. That doesn't mean that you stop being you. Right. Right. Yeah. There's a, there's also a piece around this. When you, when you begin to understand the people that hurt you, when you begin to understand the, 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 the people that abandon you, as you begin to understand that hurt and abandonment within yourself, especially if you are spiritually going to embrace the concept of we are all one. That means all of us. Mm -hmm. You don't get to leave anybody out because you don't agree with their politics or their view of the vaccine or their mandating of a mask or their, it's all or none. You don't get to say we're all one except for that guy who was president. I don't like him. Too bad. You're, you're, he's an aspect of you. You're an aspect of him. She's an aspect of you. We're not, I'm another you, you're another me. And you don't get to pick and choose mm -hmm. or we are truly separate. And I think separation causes our pain. Yeah. I think, 1, that's, I think that's where we experience isolation is the, is trauma. Healing is community. It is. It really, really is. Cause that was one of the things that I experienced with my, I don't, I don't know if I want to word it that way. Um, I went through having complex PTSD. I experienced it. I don't actually fit the diagnosis anymore, but that was the biggest thing for me was isolating myself from that and going out and getting myself to actually find friends that really resonated with me was probably one of the biggest pieces for my healing. The, that old story of the dragon attacking the village and taking the, the princess and the, the diamonds and golds and rubies and killing all the livestock and the king and the queen build the castle walls up higher and the dragon comes back and does it again. And so they build it up higher and start leaving sacrifices and the dragon comes back and does it again and ignores the sacrifice and takes what it wants until the king and queen hire a warrior to journey up the mountain and find the dragon's cave and battle to free the princess and rescue the gold as well. And they become king and queen because they get married happily ever after. That's never been a story about a man rescuing a woman from a monster. That's our oldest archetypal story is symbolic story of trauma because trauma is the hacker, right? Just because you have a computer doesn't mean you're inviting the hackers. Hackers show up in our lives. Dragons show up in our lives. And the dragon is the only part of the story that you are not, mm -hmm. but you become in relationship to this reptilian limbic brain, lizard brain experience that keeps invading your kingdom, your body, and your livestock, how you nurture yourself, and your gold and diamonds and rubies, how you value yourself. That's what the dragon takes from you. And the dragon is trauma. The dragon is the abuser, the abandoner, the assaulter. Like it's, it's, it shows up to your realm. And it's not until your, your king and queen, your prefrontal cortex, your masculine feminine balance says, okay, go get them. And your value and your virtue comes to the surface and you say, you know what? I need to go rescue my innocence, the mm -hmm. princess. That's what the princess is, is our innocence. But remember, once the princess has been taken by that dragon, she is no longer innocent. Now she's ready to be the queen. Now that the innocence is gone, now she's that, that now she's developed. And when that, that young knight goes into the cave, which Joseph Campbell says is the cave of the innermost self. That's where the dragon hides our gold, right? Deep inside ourselves. Mm -hmm. And whether the dragon kneels and prays on his, or whether the knight kneels and prays on his sword before the battle with the dragon or after is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. It's all interconnected communication with the self to confront that thing that has shown up in our lives and has caused us suffering to the point of sacrifice and denial and betrayal of our own value system and virtues. And that's mm -hmm. what the warrior represents, the rescuing of these things from within. Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful story. Beautiful story of integrating the shadow. There's so many different ways that you can look at this. Yeah. And that's what the dragon is. I said the you can see in the logo behind me, and is that the 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 logo for our treatment center for my company has always been a dragon, because once you conquer that dragon, it becomes an ally. 
Yep. You get to use it. And that's the pain to path, wound to records to, you know, resume, wound away, tears to trail. See? And I stand here at 52 years old going, what am I without all of this? What am I if I'm not the abandoned, abused, assaulted addict like mm. you? Like, mm. like if you're not going to identify as someone who has PTSD, then does that mean you're identifying as someone who used to have it or identifying as someone who got over it? And can we really not identify as anything? Because isn't that just another identity? Mm. And are we still shooting ourselves? Or are we actually setting ourselves free? I think, I, we're, I, don't... I think we're setting ourselves free because we're recognizing that I can turn the page at any moment and I don't need to bring the old books that I wrote, I don't need to bring them. And I don't need to worry about the books I might publish in the future. And coming back to, I can just be enough right now in this moment. At some That's point, it. the dragon does stop writing your story. You know, you, you take the pen back and you say, mm -hmm. yeah, tomorrow's pages are up to me. Mm -hmm. I'm, I, I, at, at, of all this work of having been a minister as long as I have been, having been on the spiritual paths that I've been, the emotional work I've done, running a a a, a, a mental health clinic, and having psychiatrists and and masters level therapists and doctors work for me for the the past sixteen years, and being a parent coach, I really find myself on the cusp of what's next. And it's, it's fascinating, it's terrifying. And the wave that's coming to tumble me to shore, like I said, I can feel the coral reef beneath me. Mm -hmm. I have been tossed and dashed against the rocks and I'm trusting that the water and the shore will meet. And I'm scared. I, that, that is the most honest thing I think I can say is that mm -hmm. after all these years of helping others get through their terror and their dragon battles, I'm terrified. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the thing though, right? That's that awareness that you can be terrified and it doesn't fucking matter. Yeah. You don't, you can be terrified and you can have fear in your little knapsack and you can keep going with it. Like, and I like what? what you just said, you know, fear like my... you got to just remind yourself like, and fucking what I'm terrified and what, and what, and what, and what? yeah, you still, I'm still making the plans, right? How many people's five-year business plans just went to shit a year and a half ago. And mm -hmm. I'm looking at this, like, what's, I got these giant things of what I'm going to do daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, yearly things I have to build for what, what if this pandemic keeps going? What if, what if, and the fear of the thing probably is bigger than the thing, right? The fear of the thing is bigger than the thing. That's one thing I know pretty consistently in life. And number two is, I like what you said, uh, the, that little fear in my knapsack. I can, every time I open it, I can pull that out. I can go looking for it anytime I want. Mm -hmm. That doesn't change what I got to do today. And what I got to do today is create today or today is going to create me. Mm -hmm. well, I don't feel unsafe. I just feel terrified. Yes. And that feels uncomfortable, but being That's uncomfortable bizarre. doesn't mean that you're in danger. Right. And that's the mistake, right? And if we're, if you're really not connected, I was telling, I was telling my wife earlier, it's like, I've got, it's like, if this, if this feeling that I have, that's waking me up at two in the morning and keeping me up that's I've been up since two this morning. Cause I like you, it's like, I woke up and was like, and another thing and my brain was gone. I'm like, well, yeah. that's it. I'm up. And it feels like anxiety except I've worked with too many people with legit anxiety to be convinced yet, because oh. I also know I'm going through some mega stress in my life. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to just say I have anxiety. I'm going to say, look, if things go for another 15 days and I still feel like this, I'm going to go see someone mm -hmm. like I'm going to set a timeline and a finish line because I don't like the way this feels. I'm not just going to suck on it. I, I, this this will undermine my next, but I'm not ready to call this anxiety yet. I'm going to call this stress. There's another way. Yeah. And there's another way that I kind of have started to view anxiety as I've had many experiences with it is that a lot of the times anxiety can be your higher self. So the, the aspect of your soul that has already existed all timelines, 
you know, is really connected. That's the one that's connected to source the most. What if your anxiety was actually your human self trying to make sense of what your higher self is telling you about the future? So it, it doesn't, you don't have the capability as yourself now in the present to understand that. So it comes in as anxiety, but reality, realistically, it's actually excitement. So, you know, something big is happening and you want to know what it is. And you're like, what is happening? And all this energy is gaining momentum, gaining momentum. And you're like, I know something's about to happen, but you can't make sense of it because we live right now, but it's already happened, but you're sensing it and integrating it as anxiety when really it's just excitement. Like circular timeline. Yeah. Yeah. The way I, I understand the way science explains anxiety, your amygdala says Mm -hmm. something in the picture that you're holding of your future is reminding you of a traumatic experience in the past. Don't know what, and there's no timeline. So it doesn't matter if it was the past 50 years ago or the past five days ago, if it was traumatic, your, your amygdala took a picture of it, Mm -hmm. right? Somebody with khaki pants and a red shirt kicks the shit out of you and your, your amygdala takes a picture. And anytime you come across red shirt, khaki pants, you go into anxiety mode. Imagine going to Target and not knowing and not remembering that it was the red shirt and khaki pants Mm -hmm. that the the attacker wore. Just something in the vision of your future that you are holding is scary. Mm -hmm. And that's what anxiety is. But to your point, what I like about what you said And this is interesting because it's something that I had forgotten until you said it is that I feel in my body that I should know the difference between fear and and excitement because I have quote, end quote, recorded the exciting times being on a roller coaster, falling in love, uh, you know, triumph where I'm just like, yeah, this is going to work. Yes, it worked. And having that full experience, that full body rapport of knowing what I'm feeling and knowing what's real and what isn't. Fear, false evidence appearing real, Mm -hmm. right? But I have to be honest and say in this moment until you said something, I think I I can reframe what I'm feeling as excitement and not fear. Mm -hmm. I I think I am excited for something new, just that I don't know what it is. Yeah. But I love new shiny things, man. I'm so ADHD. I love new <laughs> and shiny things. This one's a big one. So feels like fear might be excitement. I take that one. Mm-hmm. Good feedback. I love that because both fear, excitement and anxiety, they all have arousal in common. Yeah. Right. And it's possible for us to misinterpret our physiological responses. Cause they go through our mental schemas. Right. Right. So we fall back to what makes most sense or what do I usually fall back to? Or what, what is the quickest way for me to make sense of this? So I can move on is what our brain is like. Yeah. So this just, this conversation just tells me I need to go do the dishes. So. <laughs> okay. Well, I would love to have you back on the podcast to talk more about this in the future. Anytime. This was awesome. I very rarely get a chance to talk like this. This is awesome. Thank you. Amazing. I love that. So where can my guests find you? If you are a parent who is a parent of teens or a child that is struggling, go to my Facebook page called Parenting Teens That Struggle. It's a private group. It's moderated by me. There are 1,300 parents already there talking about their deep and darks, their fears and triumphs. Um. And that's, that's the first free place. The second free place is my podcast, Beyond Risk and Back. That's where I interview the experts on how to parent your teen that's struggling. The third place is you can go to brabapp.com, B-R-A-B-A-P-P.com, and download for $37. You can download a 56-class parenting course. This is everything. I have ever taught parents in 20 years. I want it to be affordable for every parent. I want every parent to have access to everything I have ever been taught and everything I have ever taught about working with kids. So that's brabapp.com. That's for the parenting course app or parenting teens that struggle. 
on Facebook or Beyond Risk and Back, the podcast. Amazing. Thank you so much for coming on. And I'm sure that I will be speaking to you very soon. I will link any of the links that you just mentioned in the show notes for you guys to click on. And we will talk soon. So thank you so much. Have a great day, everybody. Bye.